Hello, my name is Emma King. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Children's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. I've been working there for the last 25 years in our dermatology department. We work with children with eczema um, and children with epidermolysis pallova and other genetic skin conditions. Uh, I'm also undertaking a, a vitamin D randomised control study looking at treatment dosing of vitamin D. Um, but today I'll be talking to you about the systematic review and meta-analysis on the use of probiotic supplementation in pregnancy, breastfeeding mother and infancy for the prevention of atopic dermatitis in children. And I'd like to thank Bink for the opportunity today for allowing me to speak about this and it's a privilege. Um, this this um, systematic review and meta-analysis was not undertaken just by me but also uh, with Nasha Amalia who's a student undertaking medical degree at the University of Indonesia. She spent a year uh, with us at the Children's Hospital and the University of Melbourne and I was her mentor in helping um, her undertake this study. Associate Professor David Orchard, who's our Director of Dermatology, and Kate Francis, our biostatistician. Uh, we were fortunate and um, published this uh, research in the Australasian College, uh, Journal of Dermatology um, in November 2019, and here are the references if you would like to look it up. So today I'll be talking about the background of the project, the method, the results and, some, and a conclusion. So with the background, um, so I've been working at the Children's Hospital for the last uh, 30 years and 25 years in paediatric dermatology. And we look after many, many children with eczema at our institution. And um, atopic dermatitis is very common in Australia and it's a chronic inflammatory disease and it affects 30% of children in Australia. Uh, and as you can see, the um, children have red, rough, dry skin, inflamed skin that's very itchy and keeps them awake at night time. Uh, go back. So what causes atopic dermatitis? There's no single cause. Cause There are a lot of genes that have been implicated with disease, but we don't know what's important and what ones we need and what ones we don't need. But we know it's genetic and there's someone normally, one of the parents normally have asthma, eczema, or hay fever. And we also know that it's triggered off from the environment. So we know children with eczema aren't born with eczema. They develop it from six, six uh, weeks to two, to two months of age. Um, most children do grow out of it. Uh, but there are the children who are, have quite severe eczema um, tend to be the ones about five to ten percent that will have it as adults. We know that it's triggered off also by the environment, such as things like heat, overheating with heaters, blankets, um, and clothing. Uh, prickly things also triggered off, such as uh, wool or sand pits, and um, dry skin and dry air. Um, so the drier the skin, the more itchy the skin and the more likely to become infected from scratching. We know that the skin structure of an atopic, uh, atopic eczema patient is disordered. They have a disordered barrier function and um, they have a phalagrin deficiency which increases permeability um, and they have a reduced antimicrobial function. So they also have decreased ceramides and an increase in the skin pH. We also know that the immune system of the skin is a bit skewy in that um, there is a predominating activity of the TH2 um, especially in interleukin 4 and 13. We also know that some children but not all children also have an, a raised IgE level um, and eosinophils and this further exacerbates the reduced barrier function. We also know that the skin surface microbiome is a bit skewed as well so they have this increased Staphylococcus aureus colonisation um, and also an increased risk of viral skin infections such as warts, molluscan contagiosum and herpes simplex virus. Um, so Ku et al um, published an article that showed there's an early exposure antibiotics may be associated with allergic disease development and we know that before uh, using bleach bars, we probably used to use a lot of antibiotics in children um, with eczema because they have, as I said, a predisposition to be, be 
to get a lot of skin infections, bacterial skin infections. Um, so bleach baths have helped this, but we know that the antibiotic uh, exposure, as well as hygienic living conditions, um, decrease microbial stimulation, which decrease the Th1 immune response, and increase the Th2 in immune response that I was talking about before. So that's thought to trigger off allergic disease. Antibiotics also decrease um, microflora, disrupt, have an intestinal microflora disruption um, that also stimulates the Th2 um, immune response. So when Nasha, uh, I supervised Nasha Malia for her um, honours degree at Melbourne University, we discussed what systematic review and meta-analysis we could undertake. So we decided to look at the potential role of probiotic supplementation in um, particularly pregnant mothers, breastfeeding mothers and infants. So supplementation of probiotics during pregnancy show and it, um, this shows to produce a high level of interferon gamma in cord blood um, and infants are predisposed to AD atopic dermatitis when they have an impaired interferon gamma activation. So we also know that supplement, supplementation during breastfeeding increases the level of IgA um, and TGF-B1 in the breast milk. And this helps prevent antigens entering the intest infant's intestinal surface, thereby reducing the risk of allergy. And in regards to the direct supplementation to the infant, we know that um, probiotics may improve barrier defence and reduce permeability of the intestine, thereby reducing the absorption um, of harmful molecules. So when we undertook the systematic review, um, we found there were from 2012 to 2018, there were four published systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, and then probiotics were shown to decrease the risk of developing AD, but there was no definite answer that we could find in these papers on the best method of supplementation and the specific strain or strains that, that were needed to help this from happening because not only did we want to undertake this research, but we wanted to have a clinical impact for our um, patients. So clearly not the patients we see, but the patients that may come from uh, the, the next brother or sister. So the aim of the study. We wanted to determine whether probiotic supplementation reduces the risk of atopic dermatitis in children and to decide which probiotic strain or strains are the most effective, as well as the administration method and the length of duration of these supplementations. supplementation. So with the method, we took, undertook a comprehensive electronic bibliography uh, search, which was undertaken between the 23rd of August and the 15th of October, 2018. The databases that we used were Ovid Medline, Embase, PubMed and Cochrane. And 1,098 studies were identified. Our inclusion criteria uh, were children between 0 to 18 years of age who were so assessed to have atopic dermatitis. The type of intervention that we um, put in our search was probiotic supplemented to pregnant mother and or breastfeeding mother and or children, which we will be known as IF. Study design, we looked at were RCTs, um, non-RCTs, clinical trials and cohort studies. And um, we included English language articles published in the last 10 years between 2018 to, 2000, to current. So the exclusion criteria um, were children above 18 years of age or uh, type of intervention. So we excluded prebiotics or symbiotic supplementation and articles that in, were other, in other languages other than English. The quality assessment tools that we used to assess the research papers were Pedro assessment tool for the RCTs or clinical trial studies and the NOHES for the, for the cohort studies. So we found 21 studies with a total of uh, 31,252 children that were included within these 21 studies, 10,175 in the probiotic group and 21,077 in the control group. Um, so from the 21 included studies, there were 17 original studies and 21 studies had one, uh, sorry, two studies had one follow-up study and one study had 
two follow-up studies. In total, 24 probiotic strains were used and they were administered either as a single or a mixture of probiotic strains. Uh, the duration and method of supplementation, population group, as well as the follow-up time heterogeneous. So therefore it was difficult to come to a clinical con conclusion and recommendation for our clinics. So we firstly developed an overall estimate and then we undertook three sub-meta-analyses um, to try and drill down to what was important. Um, so we did this for according to probiotic strains, method of supplementation and also the population group. So for the overall estimate, you can see here a forest plot. Um, and this, this uh, forest plot shows the overall estimate all, of all the included studies. And the included studies determined that the probiotic supplementation to breast milk, uh, sorry, to the breastfeeding mother and or the pregnant mother and or the infant uh, reduces the risk of AD in the probiotic group when compared to the control group. And in fact, it also helped the control group, but with the, um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, ignore that bit please, but it, I'll move on to the next one. So with the submeter analyses, we looked at the probiotics that were supplemented, and this is where it got confusing. So the submeter analysis indicated that children um, supplemented with a probiotic mixture had a reduced risk of 28% of AD compared to the control group. Um, as you can see, um, the, these are the probiotic groups, so HN001, where uh, the studies and just used this probiotic and these studies had a mixture of probiotics. These are the specific mixtures um, at what age they followed up and the study approach of whether it was pregnant mother, breastfeeding mother or infant. Um, and then we looked at another meta-analysis uh, which we looked at the method of supplementation so whether the um, they use preg with whether the pregnant mother, breastfeeding mother, or infant was su supplemented, or pregnant mother or just infant, or just pregnant mother and breastfeeding mother, no infant, just pregnant mother or infant, and we actually found that um, administering probiotics to pregnant mother, breastfeeding mother, and infant continuously reduce the risk of uh, developing atopic dermatitis by 25% when comparing to the control group. Then we looked at the um, population group. So we looked at high risk, meaning atopic families, compared to normal risk of, uh, of developing eczema, such as non-atopic um, families. And it was found that um, high risk children in the probiotic group had an in increased reduced risk of 24% a developing AD when compared to the con control group. So with conclusion, um, a mixture of probiotic strains supplemented to the pregnant mother, breastfeeding mother and infant reduces the risk of AD in children. And probiotic supplementation is more effective in the high risk population in reducing the risk of AD in children, which is what we know we're treating. So then in regards to clinical recommendation, we decided, well, what will we do with this information? How can this make a difference to our patients? Uh, for parents wanting to have more children that have got a child with eczema and they want to reduce having another child with eczema. So there were three studies that were effective in reducing the risk of AD in children. Um, and uh, these were the uh, Retava, et al, Simpson et al, and Enomoto et al. And these were the different probiotic strains that they used and the dosage of these probiotic strains, the length of treatment and how long they followed them up for. So in each of these three studies, the probiotic strains were different. So that gave us another dilemma. Well, what do we do here? Which ones do we choose? Which ones do we not choose? Um, and the, as you can see from the, the forest plot, um, the Enomoto um, uh, sh showed good result under one for, uh, where is this? 
However, the confidence interval is wide. There are two that had good results and a, a, a narrower confidence interval. So, um, however, um, we had to decide on what was available in Melbourne, Australia. So how did we choose what we would recommend? So we had to choose, we had to find out, well, what probiotics are available in Australia for the infant and the mother? And we had to see if that, if what was available here is actually be relatable to what we found in our study. So for the infant, um, we found, we, from a search of, um, on the internet, we found 10 available infant probiotic products that are available in, in Australia. Uh, we included probiotics that are recommended from birth to six months. So not uh, some probiotics in Australia are only uh, recommended for six months plus. So we clearly um, want, to, want to supplement children from birth. So we had to reduce it down to the ones that were um, available for birth to six months or older. We excluded then by looking at those two points, eight infant probiotics due to, to incorrect age range, probiotic strains or strain not being included in the three trials and the probiotic combination being different than the three trials. So we found two infant probiotics available with the correct strain and combination. So this related more to the Enomoto studies and um, in the probiotic one, uh, these are the two uh, of the probiotics that were um, listed in the Enomoto study. The only problem here is they're half less the dose of what um, was studied in this study. Um, and then probiotic two, um, we find that uh, once again, there are three uh, that were mentioned in the study. However, once again, they were less, less of a dose. And then for the mothers, how did we decide again? Um, so we, we did a search and we found that there were five available mother probiotic products also for breastfeeding as well as pregnancy. We excluded four of these due to the probiotic strain or strains not included in the three trials and the probiotic combination being different than the three trials. So that left us only with one probiotic um, product that, was, uh, that we felt that we could re recommend for the mothers to take in the third trimester of pregnancy. Um, and once again, it was the Enomoto. So that left us with only one probiotic, but once again, there were two of the three listed and they only, and they only had a, they had a less dose of what was, you know, what, what was administered in the trial. So there is a need for further research, um, high quality, and we also need long-term follow-up studies. Um, so we also need to observe whether a, a single or mixture probiotic strains and in individual treatment arms, including high-risk groups, must be given to pregnant mothers in the final trimester, breastfeeding mothers for six months and infant for six months. And um, we need some, back on this, we need to look at the development of co commercially available products that have the relevant effective strains, doses, and that are cost effective as well, because eczema is quite costly when you, um, when you consider the need for topical steroids, moisturisers, wet dressings, bath treatments, special shampoos, special sunscreens, and other supplementations such as vitamin D. Um, so I'd like to thank my co-researchers, Nasha Amalia, Professor David Orchard, Kate Louise Francis, and acknowledge Pochar and Dr. Pithika. Um, and these are the faculties that we currently work in. Thank you very much, it's been a privilege.